And on your screen is Brian Melton's new book, Robert E. Lee, A Biography. Professor Melton, why have over 2,000 books been written about Robert E. Lee? <laughs> because he's such a fascinating man and such an integral part of American history. And it's just that simple. Uh, and then, of course, there's the fact that after the war was over with, when so many people, particularly south of the Mason-Dixon, were so desperate to revisit the war and try to figure out where could they have won, uh, Lee came to sort of epitomize that idea uh, that if only Lee had been in charge the whole time, if only Lee had been able to lead them better, uh, then perhaps the South could have won the Civil War and that would be a little bit of a change to U.S. history. Was Lee a successful military general? Yes, he was. Uh, and at the same time, he wasn't, obviously. On the one hand, Lee won some amazing battles. Uh, you can look at Second Bull Run as an example. Uh, you can look at Chancellorsville. Second Bull Run's been called his greatest victory. I personally prefer Chancellorsville. Uh, at Chancellorsville, uh, Lee had taken an army that was outnumbered almost two to one. He then splits that army in the face of the enemy, flanks that army, almost destroys uh, Hooker's, Joseph, uh, Joseph Hooker's right, fl uh, right flank. Uh, and then at the height of his success, he loses Jackson. It slows them down for a second. Reinforcements start coming up into his rear. He splits his army a third time, beats off that attack, and then returns in time to chase Hooker back across, uh, back across the river. Uh, and you look at that, you couldn't script that kind of thing. This is not the kind of story you could make up. People would say it wasn't believable. Uh, other instances where Lee, by sheer willpower, uh, was able to win where other people said it was impossible. Uh, outside Richmond in 1862, uh, when Lee fights the campaign against uh, McClellan, uh, he manages over the course of a week to chase McClellan all the way back from the gates of Richmond to the James River, uh, fights a series of battles. He only wins one. He loses the others, sometimes pretty badly, and he still manages to win the campaign. At the same time, uh, I think Lee as a human being uh, had some notable flaws, like, like we all do. Uh, and those flaws, plus the overall geopolitical situation that the, that the South faced, meant that really no matter what he did, uh, he was not in a situation to eventually win the war. What were some of his flaws? One of his chief flaws as a military commander uh, was his inability to confront uh, his men when he was having problems with them. Lee uh, was raised by his mother. Uh, his fa he, he only saw his father a few times when he was a child. His father actually died when he was very young. His father was the famous Revolutionary War General Light Horse Harry Lee. Um, and Lee never managed to hold down a job. He never managed to successfully take care of his family. He was constantly... Um, uh, constantly entering into all these speculations and losing badly. And I think when Robert Lee uh, saw that, uh, he really learned from that. Uh, and so he got one half of his driving personality from kind of an idea that he wanted to succeed where his father had failed. At the same time, after his father passed away, uh, he saw a much more gentle, a much more gentle and responsible side of parenting from his mother. So he really seems, when he gets into command, to exhibit sort of both sides uh, of this almost split personality. On the one hand, obviously, like at Chancellorsville, where I just mentioned, uh, he could have a driving, aggressive personality uh, where he could f enforce his will on a much greater foe and emerge victorious. On the other hand, when he was dealing with his, uh, de dealing with his, uh, his men, if one of them did something he didn't like, Lee would very rarely confront them directly. Uh, he would make suggestions. Uh, he would say that it would probably be better if they did something else. And if they failed too often, rather than actually deal with the situation, he simply exiled them to the Western Theater. And that did wonders for Lee to a certain extent uh, because he would get rid of the people that he wanted to get rid of. But it meant that the Confederate Western Theater was a dumping ground for all of these uh, Eastern commanders who had shown they weren't up to snuff. Uh, and over in the Western Theater, of course, they're dealing with Grant, they're dealing with Sherman, 
They're dealing with James Birdseye McPherson. And so you're sending your dregs to take care of Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with Lee's own personality uh, and the way he handled problems. Well, you refer in your book, in your biography, to his savage moods. What did you mean? Lee uh, had a huge temper. Uh, in that, he was sort of like his, uh, uh, his um, idol, George Washington. Uh, Washington was an incredibly controlled individual. And a lot of people don't realize that Washington had a horrible temper. And when he lost it, he could spew profanity with the best of them. Um, Lee was the same way. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why he led such a tightly controlled, self-disciplined existence, because he knew what his temper was capable of, and he wanted to keep it in constant check. Brian Melton, you walk us through Lee's life, April 1865. Lee, by that point, had really been ready to give up uh, as, a, as an army commander for quite some time. Uh, Lee was suffering pretty seriously from uh, various medical conditions that, of course, at the time he just wrote down to rheumatism, uh, but we now know probably had to do with some of the heart conditions that eventually contributed to his death. Uh, and in fact, earlier, uh, he had actually written uh, to Jefferson Davis and had asked to be relieved of command. Davis, though, was, he was sold on Lee, of course. Lee was already then Robert E. Lee. Uh, how do you replace Robert E. Lee as a Confederate general? Uh, and so he wrote back and said that uh, he trusted Lee, that he uh, knew that there was no one else who could do the job better than Lee. And so from then on out, Lee fights the best that he can, all the way back well into the, uh, the Overland campaign. He fights the best that he can, but at the same time, uh, he knows it's a losing battle. Uh, but it's not his job as a soldier to, uh, to make that decision as far as he's concerned. So during the last month, Lee is just barely holding on. What had been going on is Grant is constantly getting reinforcements uh, in the Petersburg trenches. And every time Grant gets reinforcements, he stretches his line farther and farther towards those all-important railroad lines that are, leading, that are leading into Richmond. When Grant uh, eventually gets to the point where he thinks he has Lee overextended, he orders an attack. Uh, this, this is a process that, that repeats itself. Lee uh, repels the attack. Uh, Grant extends, 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 probes again. Finally, it just gets to the point where Lee realizes that he doesn't have the ability to, uh, uh, to, continue, this, to continue the war. And so he sort of bets it all on one last attempt uh, to break the Union line. Uh, he sends his most trusted commander that he has left, uh, one of his most trusted commanders, John B. Gordon, on an attack that actually successfully breaks the federal line, but then fails miserably. Uh, when Grant realizes that, he launches counterattacks that break Lee's lines in multiple places. Lee uh, is not able to fix it. Uh, he orders the evacuation of the Confederate capital. And from then on, it is literally a uh, almost a dog chasing its game uh, type of situation where Lee is desperately trying to stay ahead of Grant and Grant is carving up huge chunks of what was left of his army. Um, Lee eventually... Did Lee have a, a destination at that point? Uh, he was headed uh, first for Amelia Courthouse uh, to try to get... In Virginia. Uh, to try to get... Um, to try to get... Re to try to get... Try to be resupplied. Uh, but Grant eventually catches up with him, uh, and at Appomattox, uh, Grant is able uh, to get ahead of Lee. Uh, it's actually Sh Philip Sheridan's men get ahead of Lee. Uh, and Lee, by this time, only has about 25,000 men left. Uh, uh -huh. Compared to? Compared to Grant's well over 100,000 total. Uh, Lee does not want to surrender still. He knows it's inevitable. Some of, his, some of his top commanders, the ones that are still left, start talking about surrender. Uh, Lee actually sacks some of them <laughs> rather at that point rather than let them talk about it because he wants to send the message that he is the one who will make this decision, no one else. Uh, at Appomattox, when he realizes what he's facing, he orders one last assault. Um, Gordon initially makes some, uh, some headway, but 
infantry reinforcements come up. Gordon says, I can't do it without heavy reinforcements. Uh, Lee says, okay, that's it. Uh, we